Hey, it's Matt Pinfield from the KLOS Studios, and I've got Taylor Mumson from The Pretty Reckless with me on the show, new and approved today, and we're really excited that the fourth album is finally coming out on February 12th. The album is Death by Rock and Roll. Such a great song, the lead-off track from the album, and Taylor's taking the time to hang out with us today and, uh, and talk about it. Taylor, it's great to see you. Great to see you, man. How are you doing? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. You know, it's funny. You and I were communicating a lot during the pandemic, you know, staying in touch and, uh, you know, very excited about the record finally having a release date, which is cool. I know, finally. It's been, I feel like it's the longest time ever. And we've, it, like, I've been waiting and waiting and waiting. And finally, February 12th. And now it's just like days away. It's like, the, the, you know, the countdown begins. <laughs> Absolutely. And the new single, by the way, is great. And so it went with Tom Morello. You know, one of the things that, you know, you and I bonded over very early was um, our love of Soundgarden and Chris Cornell. And um, I remember doing an interview with you years ago. And you were, it was the time when you were up for going on tour with Soundgarden. uh, And you were so excited. So was the rest of the band. Um, And then they picked you, of course, to do that tour. And since then, you know, we know we lost Chris. But you've you've done some amazing tributes to him, like during the Detour Festival, which was for Save Our Stages. You did a version of The Keeper. I was hosting that event. Um, can you talk to me a little bit more about your love of Chris and Soundgarden and why he's one of your favorite vocalists and artists of all time? Oh, man, I, I don't even know where to begin. Um, I just, I heard, I heard Soundgarden uh, when I was quite young and it struck a chord in me that uh nothing else had ever hit me like that before i mean the the it hit me in such a different way i mean like the beatles had like a, the beatles had had a huge impact on my life up until that point but but when i heard soundgarden it was the the musicality and the complexity and the just the overall power and yet sensitive side of it like it, it just it blew my mind and then obviously i mean chris's voice is just otherworldly i mean no, no one no one no one sings like him um and then on top of that just the lyrical content of soundgarden and how how deep the songs were and how many levels um and layers there were that you could you know i could listen to them over and over and every time i heard something new and i discovered something else inside the song and it, and I, to this day i still do and so i that's that's really where it, it started for me and then obviously i i delved into his you know, entire catalog and not just Soundgarden of, you know, Audio Slave and solo stuff as well. Um, but I mean, just, man, what, like, what an icon just, 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 you know, he's one of the, he's, he's a God, you know, he's, he's a rock God. He's one of those, you know, what else do you call him? Now, you know, you were obviously a big fan and what was it like the first time that you guys met when you uh, knew that you were going out on the road at that first date? What was that experience like? I. Uh, extraordinarily exciting and and kind of shocking actually the first time we met on i had met him um a few years back previously at like some event and stuff kind of in passing but uh on on that tour the first time we really spoke was i was sitting outside the dressing room i was there with uh you know with the band kato was there um we we're just hanging out uh <laughs> and it was a very sunny day and i couldn't really see and i just see this kind of this very tall shadowy figure start to approach me and as i look up i i someone smacked me and went that's chris it's chris cornell taylor like it's chris cornell stand up and as i stood up in like awe he was like you know the sun was blazing behind him he looked like he looked like jesus or something um (laughs) and i stood up and, and you know and we had a very nice uh relatively long conversation just about music and we talked about King Animal because uh you know that was obviously their, their last record um and just how much I loved it and and uh he was just he was so great he was just the kindest kindest person kindest soul and um you know getting to just even share a couple few moments in his presence was um was was insane now the day when you tell me about the experience of when you found out that we lost Chris um man the uh devastating is an understatement i mean um we we were there that night in detroit we you know we played that was the last night of that tour of the 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 leg of that tour um 
we played, they played. Uh, I, I stayed outside, you know, we were where all the buses were parked. We were all um, in the back parking lot. You know, I, I was waiting. I kind of had come to realize what Chris's schedule was or not schedule, but his kind of routine. Um, and he, he tend to leave right after the show. So I was kind of waiting by the back door, knowing that it was the last end of tour and I wanted to thank him for everything and, you know, say whatever I was going to say. Um, and I did, I caught him as he was walking out and, you know, we had a nice little discussion. I gave him a big hug. Um, let's do it again sometime kind of, you know, and, uh, and then we continued on with the night, you know, was hanging in, hanging in the, the back parking lot with, with Matt and Kim and Ben and, you know, the rest of our band. And again, Kato was there. And it was just, it was just this big kind of celebration that we couldn't believe that we were, um, that we were there and that, you know, in one way sad that, you know, the tour was over, but, you know, elated that we were a part of it, like just is, you know, very, um, very great. And, and so, you know, then bus call happens and we, we rolled out and on to the next city. And the next morning I woke up to the news um, of just is crushing. I, I could I was in disbelief, I guess is, is the right word. I, 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 I was convinced that everyone was lying to me. Um, and this was some awful joke. And it, and it was it was not um, it was not. And it that was kind of the start of um a bit of a downward spiral for me where I, I, I was not emotionally prepared, not emotionally prepared to kind of handle that, um, that kind of trauma, uh, and that kind of shock. And we were in the middle of, uh, of a touring cycle at the time, you know, we were touring our record, who you selling for, and, and we had a lot of, a lot of shows booked and we played a few after, um, after that. And I just, I wasn't handling it well. Like I, I wasn't able to get on stage every night and, um, and entertain an audience when I was so crushed. Uh, it, it felt very fake and very forced. And I, and I came to the realization that I was not in a good place to be public. So I, I stepped back, I, I canceled the rest of tour. I went home to kind of um, process what had happened and try to wrap my head around it. And, and as soon as I kind of started to get my feet back on the ground, not to just immediately dive into this, but you know, as soon as I started to kind of uh, start to move forward, I started writing some songs. I, I called Cato. I was like, you know, let's, let's uh let's you know let's get in the studio let's start recording something I, I don't know if it's for a record or for what but i have some i have some songs um let's let's just start doing something um as, start, as soon as we started to put those plans into motion uh i got the phone call that Cato died in a motorcycle accident and that was kind of just the i don't know the the nail in the coffin for me where i just i kind of i spiraled very down uh into this kind of very, very dark hole of the depression and substance abuse and, you know, everything that comes along with that of uh, just this very, very dark space that I didn't really know how to get out of. And I didn't really know if I wanted to, I kind of, I kind of gave up on everything. Um, I kind of like, I quit life, I guess is how I, is how I kind of say it. Um, and to make a very long story short, which that, not that that was a short story, but to make a very long story of, of, you know, my attempt of my healing process and, and, and getting through all this was, it was music. It was the thing that I finally, you know, I, I finally turned to again, um, after kind of shunning it for so long, cause it just, it felt too painful, but I started, I started at the beginning, you know, I started listening to the Beatles records. That's where I started. I went, you know, where did I fall in love with this in the first place? I'm going to start there. And I went through every Beatles record and all the demos and the anthology and, you know, watched every video I can find and all the documentaries and then, you know, got into then Pink Floyd and Led Zeppelin and The Who and, um, you know, Bob Dylan and Neil Young and Jimi Hendrix and eventually getting to be able to listen to Soundgarden again and not, you know, like break down. <laughs> um, yeah. And that, uh, and that, you know, list and just listening to those records provided me with so much comfort, um, Eventually, you know, it was very painful at first, but eventually they, they provided me with the comfort that they always have. And that led to me picking up a guitar and and not trying to write. But because I say that I didn't have to try to write this album like this record, it poured out of me whether I wanted it to or not, um, which I think makes it a very unique record for for this band, because um, just, it, you know, normally when you write something, when you know, when you when you try to write something or whatever, you, you you're waiting for inspiration to, to slap you in the face. Like it's, it's just kind of the waiting game that can become very, um, 
very torturous in a lot of ways because you don't know where inspiration is going to come from. And in this case, inspiration had smacked me in the head and beaten me with it and there was no avoiding it. So it was kind of, uh, it was very cathartic in a lot of ways. And I think that, you know, the writing of this album was, was certainly the first step to um, me getting my, my shit together and getting, getting back on a, on a much healthier um, mental page. Yeah, you know, it's amazing because you and I have that in common that, you know, both uh, loved Chris. Chris was my friend, and I was also uh, great friends with Cato, your producer. And Cato is such a collaborator of yours and a confidant and best friend Mm -hmm. that that news was devastating. And for those people that are listening or watching us, uh, Cato had produced all the earlier records and worked right alongside Taylor amazing guy who went through his own tragedy lost his wife in this crazy period where she wasn't feeling good one day and within three days she was gone you know and there he was with with two daughters and yes you know he overcame a lot of tragedy himself and then when he was hit here in los angeles on his motorcycle it was just incredibly devastating news for everybody and i know it broke everyone's heart but so i gotta ask you with working on the 12 songs for the new album um, was, uh, did you feel like the, the spirit and of, of Cato there with you, e- um, even though it was a, a, a new process of creative and recording? Uh, I mean, absolutely. I don't think that, you know, I don't think, I don't know if I have the, the correct way to say it, but I don't think that, um, you know, a connection like that, like a connection that, you know, that Cato and I had and, and Cato and, and the rest of the band had, I mean, I don't, I don't want to speak for everyone, but I kind of can, um, <laughs> you know, we were so immensely close. It, you know, Kata was so much more than just a producer. He was essentially the fifth member of the band. Um, you know, the, the pretty reckless formed when I met Ben and I met Kato and I met, I met them together and I met Mark and Jamie afterwards. Um, so it, it, to, to, to go forward as, you know, as this unit without such a key person in our life and, you know, in my, my, best friend felt very um is very it's just very weird it's very strange and it was it was it was something we had to figure out how to overcome because like you said we'd never made an album without Cato before so just you know when I finished writing the songs just the the first thought of how the hell do we do this like I have we have no idea we don't know how to record we don't know how to who do we call we don't know like I've got all these songs now we have no idea how to how to make them um and I mean we know how to play but we don't you know it's that's a whole other you know recording's a whole other world and uh and luckily and so luckily I knew one other guy who's a dear friend of mine who I'd known for years named Jonathan Wyman who's a fantastic engineer and just honestly the, the sweetest and most genuine um person on the planet like if I, I dare you i dare anyone to meet him and walk away and say that that guy's not the nicest guy you've ever met in your life um he's that kind he's just a big teddy bear and uh and he was really he was just very he's very integral and in, um in helping us through through the grieving process and through the recording process of allowing us to kind of be the train wrecks that we were and and um and you know and not judging us for that and and he's just very understanding of the situation that we were in and and really helped kind of pull the best of ourselves out of ourselves um which is what you you know is what you look for in a, in a producer and someone who can you know help guide you um and, and especially at a time when we were so lost um he was really really uh invaluable so thank you, John. Um, but of course, Cato was there. Of course, Cato was present. I mean, it's the records made with all his guitars and all his gear and all his, you know, everything. I mean, for Christ's sakes, the, uh, you know, Death of Rock and Roll, the song itself, the, the, the first thing you hear on the album is Cato's footsteps walking down the hallway of the house aloud. So he, he's he's very much present um, in, in everything we do. And I think that, you know, this album is um, in... in in a, in a very big way, you know, it's, it's, it's in, in homage to him. And, you know, even though he's, and, and, and not just Cato, but to all the, all the, all the amazing artists and all the people that, you know, we've lost throughout the years, um, just because they're no longer here. I, I doesn't, doesn't matter. I refuse to let their, their memory and their legacy die. And I think that this, this record is, um, really kind of encapsulates that, uh, at least to a degree. 
It does. And, you know, Death by Rock and Roll is such a great song. It was a great lead-off single. And lyrically, you. you know, I mean, I mean, the song is just amazing. We love the song. We still play it a lot here at KLOS, of course. Oh, and, you. you know, when I heard the reference to Motorcycle Crash in the lyrics, I immediately thought of Cato. I knew that you were making reference, not only oh. to a lot of our, you know, fallen rock and roll heroes, but... But uh, but to Cato as well. Uh, right. and I, but so the record, 12 new songs. It's fantastic. Speaking of Soundgarden, you have a song called Only Love Can Save the Day. And Matt Cameron and Kim Thiel well, are both on there, right? I got to correct you on the title. Oh, what is it? Only Love Can Save Me Now. Oh, Save Me Now. Okay, that's all right. That's Only Love Can Save Me Now. Okay. Sorry about that. No worries. It's yeah. all good. Yeah, but... But so, so tell me about "Only Love Can Save Me Now," the song that you did with Matt and with, uh, and with Kim. And how was it? Something you reached out to those guys and said, "Hey, I really love you guys to be on this record." How did that come about? Uh, pretty much, yeah. It, it "Only Love Can Save Me Now" was a song I had written probably in the around the middle of the uh, of the of, around the middle of the record. But it was uh, it was one of the last songs we actually recorded for the for the album. Um, and when I finished writing it, you know, I, I demoed it and I, I called Matt and I called Kim and I sent them a demo and I said, guys, is this, is this something that you would want to be a part of? Because like, would you want to play on this? Because, you know, dare I say it, this song has a very Soundgarden-esque feel to it. And, you know, if you guys don't play on this, I'm just going to sound like we're ripping you off. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, yeah. so, uh, you know, that's my little joke. But um, the, in reality, no, I sent them the song and, and they were they said, absolutely. We'd, you know, we'd love to. We'd love to be a part of it. And um, we flew to Seattle and we, we actually recorded it there. And we, uh, we recorded at London Bridge Studios, which is where Soundgarden recorded Louder Than Love and Pearl Jam made 10 and Alice in Chains made Dirt. And, you know, just so many, so many iconic records have been made there throughout the years. And so to be in in that studio that just when you walk in just bleeds bleeds those albums from the walls like you can just feel the energy um because i i'm a firm believer that you know places are places are like people they have memories and, and they live inside the walls of of that space and so just to be there and then to be there with matt and kim creating something new together after you know after so much so much tragedy and loss and stuff i just I don't want to speak for them, but for me, that felt like a very full circle, kind of just very beautiful moment and really kind of showcased the power of music and how, you know, even after, even after, you know, all the hell in the world, it, it, you know, music can really bring people together. And, and just to hear, like, just, it, I mean, I light up every time I think about it, just hearing, hearing them play the song for the first time was just the coolest coolest thing that's ever happened in my life i mean the first time matt hits his snare and the first him, the first note that kim plays it's just the song lights up and immediately comes to life in in the exact way that i was expecting it would but you know you never know until you're actually in the room you know recording it and hearing it for real like you can you can imagine it in your head but not only was it what i imagined it was it was that and so much more and it just it they really took the song and, and just took it to the the highest of, of levels possible and it's is by far one of my favorite songs on the album so i'm just i'm really excited that that's finally out and people can people can hear it <laughs> yeah i mean it's a great song i and i and it, i wanted to ask you when did you realize in the writing process that you wanted them to be on the record You're like this is something i think i'm going to make that call it was uh it's fairly quickly i mean that song actually kind of that was a song that I'd started a while back and then, and then nothing really came of it. And then I don't, I don't, I don't remember exactly how it happened because songwriting becomes kind of a blur when you have to speak about it years later, like, you know, how specific there's moments that you remember vividly. And then overall it's kind of like, I'm not entirely sure where that one came from. Um, but I think that that was when I had started a while back and then kind of put down and put away and, and then I revisited it and, uh, and as soon as I finished, I think as soon as the chorus came together and I, and I, and I sang that and, and we had the riff and the chorus, it was, um, the whole thing just kind of, I, I heard it all in my head and went, they have to play this. Like they have to, like they're, they're, they're going to kill this. Um, and they do. Yeah. It's amazing. <laughs> 
Talk about working with Tom Morello on And So It Went and how that came about. Was that another situation where you reached out to Tom and thought, he'll be perfect for this song? Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> kind of somewhere. I don't know how interesting these stories are. But um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, you know, I had known Tom for quite a few years now. Um, but it kind of, you know, we've met many times kind of in passing. Um, and we really we really kind of reconnected at the Chris Cornell and the Highway tribute show because we were both playing with Soundgarden on the song Loud Love. Um, so that's where we kind of re-bonded or whatever you want to call it. And uh, and shortly after that show, you know, we were starting in the studio and I had, I had just finished writing the song and so it went. And I couldn't, I couldn't hear it without Tom coming in and wailing a solo. Like he has such a unique sound to what he does he's i don't even like to call it a sound he's such a unique voice with his guitar playing um and then you know that's what i really value in in great musicians like kim thale and matt cameron and and obviously tom morello is that they're so unique in what they do that when you hear it it, it doesn't even sound like an instrument it sounds like a human voice like you're not mis- you're not hearing a tom morello guitar solo and you're and mistaking it for someone else you know yeah uh, and that's you know that's the kind of character that I really I really love in in musicians and in particular just due to the the lyrical content of the song and just kind of the overall vibe and feel of it like he just it just made so much sense to me in my head like I could I could hear it <laughs> I could hear it and so kind of the same thing with with uh, that I did with Matt and Kim I you know I demoed it and I signed it to him and said hey would you want to lend your voice to this and, and come in and rip a solo and he said yeah totally man and um, and he did, and he sent his tracks back to us. And when we put the whole thing together, it just it did exactly what I thought it was going to do. Like he just he comes in wailing, with you know full Tom Morello force, and and really just takes the song to the next level. So um, thanks, Tom. <laughs> yeah, he did a great job there. Now you and I have been in touch, of course, through doing a bunch of different charity things and just being just talking about music during the pandemic, which was very cool. Um, what are some of the other things your fans would probably want to know? Um, what were you were doing besides obviously writing music, listening to the stuff, um, you know, that, that you love, what were some of the other things you were doing to keep yourself busy during the pandemic? Cause, uh, you know, it was such an isolating period. Yeah. I mean, still is technically, yeah. I mean, I'm still not leaving my house. I don't know about anyone else, but, um, I, uh, I mean, I paint a little bit, um, my art desk kind of got overtaken by uh, Zoom and recording equipment now, so yeah. <laughs> I haven't done that in a, in a minute. But um, I, uh, I mean, I learned how to, I had to learn how to record at home. I had to learn how to record myself, um, which that was certainly new for me. I'm very technologically challenged. Um, I can't, I won't do it on a computer. I just, I don't like it. So <laughs> I record everything on a battery powered Tascam eight track. Um, I go analog with it. That's, Those task games are great. They still, even the great. ones that have been around for a few years, they record yeah. amazingly. They sound great, and well, and it's, I like the physicality of like actually being able to turn a knob and and you know move a switch and not uh, out computers. Uh, computers and, and Taylor Momsen don't mix. Um, ew, I just talked about myself in the third person. That was weird. Um, <laughs> no, computers, that was right. and myself, computers and myself do not mix. Um, so trying to figure out, you know, the technical aspects of, of, of working from home. But um, I don't know, but hanging out with my dog. I've been, um, I was just joking that I got to the end of Netflix, which I didn't think that was possible. But I think I think I finally reached the end of Netflix. Um, and, you know, uh, trying to learn to cook kind of but not really that that didn't that didn't end up so well um i can still pretty much just make breakfast for dinner yeah uh, <laughs> so, so i don't know i mean not playing a lot of guitar really that's that's what i've been doing probably the most um playing guitar and just kind of you know riding the storm out like everyone else yeah well i, I, I really appreciate you taking the time today to hang out with us taylor and i'm excited oh. the album coming out february 12th 12 new songs uh, and people have obviously already heard two of them, but uh, I know they'll be really excited to hear the song with the Soundgarden guys and the rest of the stuff that you've been working on. And uh, again, thanks for the, all the things you've been doing when you did the gig for Save Our Stages, the one uh, for Detour that I hosted, and also the Bowie celebration. You did you covered Quicksand. You did an incredible wow. version of uh, that Bowie thing, which was also you know for Save the Children. So uh, yeah, well, I've I've been very fortunate to 
be able to be a part of so many great causes and and just and stay creative during this time period and, and do you know and get to work on things um like the songs you just mentioned that you know if we were in a normal situation and, and the album came out a year ago we'd be on tour and you know in the middle of that grind and some i don't know what country at this point where we'd be but um it'd be somewhere and you know all all of the kind of um stripped back you know versions and covers and collaborations that i've gotten to do in, in quarantine probably wouldn't have ever come to exist um so i've been trying to look on the on the positive side of things and just you know just stay positive and stay creative and and uh keep on keeping on like everyone else you know yeah taylor thanks so much for uh, for joining me today it's great to have you on the show great always to good to see you i know i love you man it's great to see you yeah excellent thank you taylor Appreciate it. Taylor Mumpson, The Pretty Reckless, the new album, Death by Rock and Roll. Great song, great album, available February 12th. You've been watching New and Approved. This is 95.5 KLOS. I'm Matt Pinfield. Thanks for joining us.